I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's block we call The Song Outlives the Movie. My first experience with the topic we're discussing today was way back when Dirty Dancing was released in theaters. The soundtrack to that movie played constantly in my mom's car as she would drive me to and from school, camp, taekwondo lessons, etc. The original song written for the film, I've Had the Time of My Life, skyrocketed up the music charts and would forever be remembered along with this film. Since this is the Grindhouse Institute, we're going to shake things up a bit by exploring some films where songs we remembered, but the films that brought them into the world might have been forgotten. Steve David is sent to Chino, a minimum security prison run by a warden who believes that inmates should be treated as human beings, develop skills, learn trades, and one day soon be reunited with the rest of the world. In the meantime, a familiar haunting melody can be heard throughout the film, culminating in a beautiful on-screen performance by opera singer Todd Duncan. Elroy Hirsch stars in Unchained from 1955. Former outlaw Pat Garrett is now on the other side of the law, pursuing his friend Billy the Kid Bonnie. The two will play cat and mouse across both old and new Mexico while Bob Dylan tunes play on the soundtrack including a scene where a sheriff is knocking on heaven's door. Starring James Coburn, Chris Christopherson, and a murderer's row of veteran Western character actors, it's Sam Peckinpah's Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid from 1973. Stop me if you've heard this one, a saxophone player and a singer walk into a bar on VJ Day. They quickly become a successful duet and not-so-successful couple. With classic Hollywood musicals as inspiration and the city that never sleeps as a backdrop, Robert De Niro and Liza Minnelli will write a classic song in Martin Scorsese's 1977 film, New York, New York. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Please enjoy. And that's what you're going to call it, New York? New York. I thought since we met in New York, we live in New York. My vagabond. Shoes. Shoes are longing to stray and step around the heart of it. New York, New York. Welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster. With me, as always, is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are you? Well, you know... Some days it's kicks, and other days it's kicks in the shin. Top of the heap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the top of the heap, huh? Is that what, yeah. uh, Okay. Oh, uh. I don't have to say heap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we live in New York. You know, we met in New York. and. You know. <laughs> this is the most interesting subject I think we've had on this show. Um, a yeah, subject that was brought up to us by friend of the show, Andy, who's joining us today. I'll let Jeremy do the intros again. Um, actually, I'll let him do that right now. There you go. Right on. Uh, yeah, so we're, uh, we're exploring a, a fun little topic here. We, it, it, it was born out of a conversation we had on, I think, uh, Andy's first episode um, where we talked about um, the man who knew too much and the song that came out of that, which was uh, K Sera Sera and essentially we had a conversation about it and we thought about like, well, what are some other films where very popular music came out of, uh, some, um, you know, lesser known films. And, uh, we've got a little array for you today. Uh, and, uh, to take us through it all, Andy Buigas. Welcome. Thanks. Excited to be here. This is great. Yeah. Like, uh, like you said, Jeremy, I think, um, discovering that case Sarag Sarag, that came from the man who knew too much uh, was really really cool experience and that that experience of like oh wow that song is from this movie mm-hmm. really uh, spurred this idea and even more so when uh, the song has become famous by other people covering it and so it kind of takes on its a new identity and it just becomes uh, embedded in the mind as belonging or you know originating from someone else it's really cool to, to come across these um, uh, in movie history so excited about that most definitely. Um, the three films we're talking about today are Unchained from 1955, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid from 1973, and New York, New York from 1977. And Unchained is the one that blew me away. Um, considering how popular that song was 
Unchained yeah. Melody, I should say, mm-hmm. from the movie Ghost. <laughs> you know, the yeah, Righteous right. Brothers, I believe, sang that one. This version was completely, I mean, completely the same, but sounded completely different. And this film I had never heard of in my life, so I think that this one probably works, <laughs> especially for the lesser-known well, yeah. film part of this. Le- leave it to this show, yeah, exactly, to, <laughs> to find some obscure movies. Yeah, and, and of course, th- this one is also hard to, to track down and watch. Um, but it's interesting. I, I, I feel like with all three of these songs, so I mean, so, so the songs we're talking about are Unchained Melody, Knocking on Heaven's Door, and New York, New York. Yep. But with all three of these songs, I feel like, you know, they were all sort of a hits like immediately and then were covered endlessly. Uh, but, you know, somewhere between it being a, a, a hit and a pop song, uh, it, it got lost that it originally came from a movie or was written for a movie. Um, New York, New York actually became a hit when Sinatra actually uh, started performing it in New York in 78. So, you know, right around the time the movie came out. But what's interesting is that Unchained and Knocking on Heaven's Door were kind of hits immediately. Unchained, I think it was within that same year, there were already three covers. The songs, you mean, yeah. The, yeah, the Unchained Melody song that, that was written for the movie. Uh, within that same year, there were already three covers that hit the Billboard Top 10 in the U.S. and another three that hit the, the same Billboard Top 10 in the U.K. So it was... Wow. That one became a huge hit uh, right away wow. in, a, in a standard. Um, and then Knocking on Heaven's Door, you know, was actually... Uh, you know, part of the soundtrack that that Dylan wrote for the film and the album itself, um, although it was not necessarily well received, Knocking on Heaven's Door was a huge hit that came out of it and then became, you know, covered multiple times. So that's one thing that all three of the movies have in common. And you ruined it for me. So apparently Axel didn't make this song up himself <laughs> in Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah, you know, for, I, I, I thought maybe it had been written for Days of Thunder, but I was completely mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> I was completely yeah. mistaken. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny, Unchained <laughs> Melody wasn't written for Ghost. <laughs> like, exactly. The Righteous Brothers. Like. That's a fascinating one. Not that it you know is written for Ghost, but it it's interesting right. that it became this huge hit. Um, and then 1965, the Righteous Brothers covered it, and that became what they call the jukebox standard, right? The one that everybody associates with the song. Right, right. Um, Unchained sure. Melody. Yeah. And then it got like a you know, rediscovery or revitalization in, um, when it, you know, premiered in, in Ghost. So that was, uh, and then that got associated, that became associated in popular culture. So it's interesting how kind of it jumped from this one movie where it was created and written for it. And then it became a a hit on its own as a, as a, um, as a single. And then it became associated with Ghost just because of the popularity of the film. So it's kind of had this life of its own in movie history. But we, we've talked about um, how, you know, people like Tarantino can use a song to kind of change, um, you know, the original vibe of the song, if you will, with whatever's mm-hmm. visual on screen. Um, I yeah. think Unchained, the lyrics and everything work, work really well for this movie. It was clearly written for what this movie was about. Um, right. And I think it works for Ghost, too. So it's interesting to hear the two different versions, <laughs> um, you know, like right. with a different context. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a song about longing for a lo- for a love that you're separated from so mm-hmm. that is actually i had the very same thought which is in watching it is that um and i think it goes for all three of these movies and i'm sure we'll get to that but um you know the movies are so or i'm sorry the songs are so uh embedded in our mind as part of popular culture and they've taken mm-hmm. on a life of their own in the sense that when you listen to them you uh, bring your own uh meaning to them right um you know for a long time knocking on heaven's door just had this uh, kind of anti-war association that I always had with it, uh, and uh, mm-hmm. especially because uh, of additional lyrics that were um, written for mm-hmm. it in, in some of the covers later on, especially mm-hmm. the um, Guns N' Roses one. Um, but even then, I remember that it was used in the trailer for um, Black Hawk Down, and it was like they had a, a teaser trailer that used the knocking on heaven's door, and it was oh, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just there's this like anti-war association that I always had with the with the song but when you watch the movie you realize that like it was very specifically written for a scene in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid uh, yeah you know when he says mama take this badge off me he's referring to a character right in the movie the lyrics, yeah <laughs> and like Slim Pickens uh, wife or whatever his name mama yeah. or whatever <laughs> what in the wide wide world of sports is going on here <laughs> 
<laughs> and in its, you know, when it said in the in the song when it says it's getting dark too dark to see, it's, it's it just matches that scene in the in the movie where um, Slim Pickens is sitting um, beautiful by, by that river and the sun's going mm-hmm. down behind him as his life's expiring. What a shot, right? Yeah, and it's. You know, it's not the association that, you know, I've carried for years with the song, right? Um, you know, no. like there's also the associations of Guns N' Roses and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe some people associate it with, you know, Days of Thunder. And so you bring up a good point because it's like with all three of these songs, like what helps them sort of transcend their origin, which are these movies, is just, you know, sort of how uh, broad the, the and, and interpretable, you know, the lyrics are. Right. You know, it's, it's not Unchained Melody is not specifically about a guy in a minimum security prison, you know, in longing chains. to be out and, and be with his wife or whatever, you know, it, you can apply that to, to other contexts. Mm-hmm. And same with, you know, Knocking on Heaven's Door and, and New York, New York. It's not about like <laughs> two musicians who are not meant to be with one another, <laughs> uh, you know, and like trying right. to trying to make it in the music industry. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah, in, in New York, New York, right, the... The song is about, you know, these characters that are trying to aspire to succeed in New York. But the association that we most now carry with the song is of the city of New York, right? Um, right. Whereas the yeah. city is a character in the movie. And I think, you know, um, Liza Min- Minnelli's character specifically says that's why she names the song, right? Because their life kind of um, centers around New York. But this is more of a first person perspective song speaking, right? It's not about the, right. the city. It's about my feelings about my vagabond shoes, et cetera. Right. <laughs> well, you know, with New York, New York, what's really great about the song is that I think, um, unlike the other two songs that we're talking about, um, it's just worked into the script so well, right? I mean, yes. she's liter- literally, both of them in their journey together are writing the songs, right? Mm-hmm. Jimmy Doyle is putting, you know, creating the music for it and Francine, um, as a show of her love for him is is putting these lyrics on it, um, representing uh, and also using their art to express their love for each other uh, in a way and, and how it brings them together, right? Their relationship comes together, not just in the kind of the personal love they have for each other, but in the way their kind of artistic talents work together, right? Mm-hmm. And it's so great because you get pieces of the song throughout the movie as they're kind of putting it together. And mm-hmm. it, it's, it's funny you say that because like I, I had... I had just the, the the opposite reaction where I was like, "Oh, they're trying to like retrofit the the song to the movie." Oh, you know what I mean? Like, "Oh, we're gonna write a a movie around this song." It is was what I assumed. I think the first time I saw it, I, I didn't realize it was from that movie. I didn't realize it either, but I started to maybe suspect it. But I guess the point the point I was getting at is that you mm-hmm. you recognize the song because obviously I watched the movie yeah. many years <laughs> after I, you know, become very very familiar with the song, and so you start to recognize the tunes, right? So the you know the first couple the bars of the the piano bars the first mm-hmm. piano bars of the song you're like oh you kind of get it and then you get a little bit more and then mm-hmm. you know he reads the lyrics she put together so you get some of the lyrics and you recognize it <laughs> um and you start to get a sense of the theme of the movie about how they um work so well creative they can work so well creatively together but a lot of that genius that makes them successful um keeps them apart personally right and so um that starts to like take the form of the song, right? Because uh, that starts to, let's say, um, be represented by the song, right? Jimmy Doyle becomes successful and launches his career off of this song, uh, the mm-hmm. music from the song. And Francine becomes successful as a singer and, and records the song. And then at the end, when they finally come together, she finally performs the song for him, something that you know she's been wanting to do for a while. And he finally takes a second to listen to it. And then you get the full impact of the song. And you realize, wow, the song is so powerful in the film. And yet for us, it's just uh, associated as this kind of very important piece of music. In, in yeah, like New music. York Anthem or something. Yeah, the, yeah, the theme of New York. Yeah. Right. But not just that, just since born Anthem and also a super iconic song for Frank Sinatra, right? It's one of the first songs that comes yeah. to mind when you think of Frank Sinatra. So. I mean, you ask anybody now where that song came from, they're going to say Frank Sinatra, or nine times out of ten they will, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, that was the music of that film uh, was my favorite part of it by far. Um, I feel like there's a lot of lot of time in this movie spent on things that I could have done without. Um, this is probably <laughs> the longest feeling film from Scorsese that I've watched. That's enough of my negativity, yeah. though. 
Um, the music <laughs> in this movie and the performances and everything were amazing. Um, as as per usual, just that opening shot alone of uh, VJ Day in New York and that long wonder that they do throughout the city. And mm. but then you know you kind of get into De Niro in his Hawaiian shirt hitting on every single girl there. And sometimes you're just like, okay, maybe we could have cut out a couple of these. They definitely had an opportunity to, to, to cut that part of it down, especially because it comes back to him because his his friend Eddie uh, is trying to get him to, uh, you know. You're talking about Carbone? Yeah, Carbone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's trying to get him to, to, to spend get, time. Making with, the coffee to go? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on, make that coffee to go. Let's go. Hey, so cool, He's trying to get him to spend time with his date's friend, and it turns out to be Francine. And so, like, <laughs> they would have been brought together back in the scene. Um, right. I think a lot of a lot of those scenes between the two when when they're first meeting, there's a heavy improvisation. I mean, that's one of the things that's the movie was known for is that uh, Scorsese talks about this. You know, he wanted to move away from kind of the the kind of gritty, realistic films that he had been known for, and so he has this homage to you know the classical musicals um, of Hollywood. And so you, you wanted to like bring his love for that to this movie. And so um, there's, you know, in the way the film's presented and the look of it um, in the sets, there's this high level of artifice um, that mm-hmm. you're kind of aware of, but he wanted to bring the subject matter as well as the performances um, that were, you know, more contemporary and verite and very tour de force. Uh, and you definitely get that right. Like a lot of the times, you have De Niro bringing his his very iconic tour de force um, performance, um, which isn't generally how these films would would have been acted out. In fact, right. some of the character actors, like um, the uh, band leader that ends up becoming Francine's like musical director, um, they just have this look and performances that are you know seem like they were straight out of nineteen forties, right? I play do, I'll elucidate. Attend a message from a certain female party. And then you have De Niro that's kind of bringing this performance, like especially one that comes to mind is the, the scene when he's driving erratic in the car and right before she goes into labor. I remember watching that for the first mm-hmm. time, just, just being completely like rocked yeah. by it. Did I ask you to get pregnant? Did I ask you? Because she's in the back seat, right? As he's driving, trying to talk to her and yell at her. Like that was a hard scene to watch. And they had like the lights going crazy as if they were driving nuts. <laughs> Obviously they weren't moving, you know, but... It was nuts. Yeah, I think that's the best example of what Scorsese was going for. Because in that scene in particular, you're so wrapped up in the performance. And I mean, it hearkens that, like, I remember, uh, you know, thinking, man, I feel just as uncomfortable as I am watching a scene in Casino, right? Like that that yeah. moment in time. <laughs> and you just get yeah. so wrapped into just how intense this moment of vulnerability where, um, you know, he's lashing out and kind of... Uh, you know, speaking the way he really feels and it's coming out and it's painful and you really feel that, right? Even though it's like you said, like it was, you know, they probably weren't really driving on the street. It was just, you know, there's a, if you take a step back or just look at the, the mise-en-scene, there's a level of artifice, but you get so wrapped up into the performance that mm-hmm. um, you forget about that, right? And I think, mm-hmm. I think that that really encapsulates like what Scorsese was going for, but I feel like, you know, maybe that's not something that would appeal to everybody. Um, or, you know, maybe just the pacing itself m- makes it hard for people to get wrapped into it. Because, you know, that's one of the things that always sticks out to me is like, to me, it's like the movie doesn't really get going until the final hour or so. Yeah, it's about the time that the, their band takes off and then she becomes pregnant, right? The first. Because uh, that's kind of technically m- when she kind of goes on her own or about to go on her own, right? Well, it's the first major obstacle in their relationship, right? Like up until then, they get married, and I feel like they're... the movie could have started there. O- almost, I, I, it's interesting. I, I was thinking about this because, like, I, I know Brian, uh, you mentioned like the other day how you, you were feeling about the movie having just watched it for the first time, and like you know how uneven it is and all this stuff. And I, I was kind of thinking like, you know, I, I'd seen it before, but I'd, I'd kind of forgotten some of the details. And what I was coming up with was, I think, I, I feel like it's hard to get invested in the story because the first hour and a half roughly it is it, just it, it is kind of a mess and then the, the last maybe 45 minutes to an hour especially when Liza Minnelli starts to take off uh, right around the time that she gets her record contract yes and De Niro's in the the Harlem Jazz Club watching his uh, real-life wife uh, you know sing Honeysuckle Rose 
or at least his wife at that time. I mean, from there you get the the scene Andy was just talking about with the, in the cab. Then they sort of you know break up when the kid's born, and then you you see that sort of musical number and and, and everything all the way to the end. I, I feel like mm-hmm. you know works really well, but that first like hour and a half, it, it's like it's so hard to find your your, your footing and like it, it's a place where it's like, you know, those two characters are fucking oil and water and they shouldn't be together and like you're not even given a moment where it makes sense that they are together at least with as horrible as things got in raging bull at least there was the first you know maybe 15 20 minutes of their relationship they had a honeymoon sort of like yeah culminates exactly where where, where their 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 courtship and their uh you know sort of salad days or whatever and like through that little montage where they were you know getting married and everything else um there's that period where it feels like the relationship is working, but before things like slide off the rails and he starts, you know, beating the hell out of her and yeah. you're like shit. In this one, it's like from the very instant they meet, like he he's being shitty to her, and and and, and she has like sort of no reason to want to be with him. It's weird. I, I mean, I didn't have any reason to want to watch him anymore, seeing how he acted. If they'd have showed him as the performer that he was first, or at least like got to that sooner, and you could mm-hmm. see those skills, then I would have understood, you know, more of the. The tormented artist or the, you know, like uh, the person that wants to be the lead and things like that, you know, is not going to let anyone take over his his spotlight. I could I could have understood that a little bit more other than how he started in the film. Because I, I was thinking, like, I mean, this isn't something you could sort of recut. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, because and, and what I was going to suggest was like that, you know, it seems like it would have been great to have him, uh, sorry, De Niro and Liza Minnelli uh, sort of get together because they were just on that touring band together and then they find out that they're really good at you know uh creating songs together and they're, they're really good professionally the boy girl act that's it you make it a boy girl act you start tomorrow night three shows nightly you're off sundays yeah exactly they're, they're a boy girl act and they're, they're really good professionally but like you know really terrible sort of personally and th- that would have been an interesting and, and like you know or maybe it's kind of like the star is born yes uh, exactly. scenario yeah which is you know I her, you know, her mother lot. sort of famously played uh, Liza Minnelli's mom. Yeah, it's a very, it's an interesting connection there, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's essentially what happens in this movie, you know, and De Niro's playing the James Mason role, but he's not on the downslope of like great stardom. He's just like, um, you know, jealous of her stardom and success and everything else. I think what challenges your engagement early on is more of a pacing thing that there is a narrative element, which is like, you know, why does she go along and get, um, swept up by Robert De Niro. Yeah, I think that you you know you could have addressed that by just like Brian said, having her be very impressed by his talent because it kind of gets lost a little bit because there isn't that scene where you know he has to prove himself to join the band. He kind of you know she kind of just gets him onto the band, but the idea is that he's very talented, and so you could imagine that she is kind of swept up by that. Also by the fact that he's so persistent and so um you know um funny pushy? at times what's that pushy no, yeah that's it <laughs> yeah but sometimes abusive yeah, yeah. <laughs> no what's persistence right a good word yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but he's also kind of funny you know and i'm just yeah. saying like i'm not saying that it's there i'm saying you could have played those things up i mean i remember I agree. Uh, uh, watching and just thinking you know robert de niro is you know can be very funny right i mean yeah. now we kind of know that because yeah, he's done he, some comedy. he was really funny in the in the road rage scene yeah you know oh right it's like right fight, exactly the, the parking space yeah, I yeah mean, it's like exactly you know, not that you wanted that scene in the, in the final movie but it was funny yeah <laughs> you know what's you know what's funny is that that's again i think that was scorsese's homage a little bit to screwball because i feel like this, uh-huh. there's a, an element of screwball comedy to that first act that i think we we all agree lasts a little too long uh before the kind of dramatic turn of the film is and, that like the cab kissing scene? Was that kind of a screwball thing where he would right. let her go and she's like... Yeah, well, not just that. Think about him like sneaking oh, out of the hotels and like yeah, pretending to yeah. uh, have a wooden leg. <laughs> like, yes, we yes, know you're not going to yes. pay the bill, sir. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> not just that. The, his homage to screw, the screwball comedy in that first act, it just goes to the fact that he's been so persistent to gain her affection, you know, and going through the, you know, doing these kind of crazy wacky things, um, right, to exactly. do it. And so I felt like there was a lot of that. So just like in those movies, you can portray it in a way where you understand that they get together, even though they go through these kind of 
wacky scenarios and and oftentimes uh, put themselves through these really difficult and embarrassing situations. I think he could have done that and, you know, it could have worked. It's just, I think, a little bit of a pacing and, and change in tone, right? Because when it turns dramatic, it turns, it, it has an element of verite like and uncomfortableness and intensity and that is very much the personal creative element of Scorsese, right? I feel like the, the, the parts where he's paying homage to these classical Hollywood genres, that's him kind of embracing those styles. But, you know, when the real kind of part of Scorsese comes out in the movies, um, it's kind of a shift in tone. And, and I think the movie picks up there for that reason, because he, you know, he just has a way of capturing your engagement and, and really bringing you in. And, you know, a lot of it is, you know, especially because, you know, I'm not exactly sure to what degree, but there was a lot of improvisation. A lot of it is just Robert De Niro and Liza Minnelli. Just they do have this chemistry, right? And so mm-hmm. I think for that reason, that sudden shift, it kind of and the fact that the pacing was a little slower at the beginning in terms of the narrative pacing, you know, it does kind of make it hard to stay engaged. And but when once you are engaged, that whole I would say middle of second act to the the end of the film is just awesome. I think it goes beyond pacing, though. I mean, it's like you know, my original uh, sort of half baked thesis was from from seeing it from the first time I saw it. Uh, was that oh okay this would have really benefited from having uh, Thelma Schoonmaker on you know it's like you know she she sort of joined the uh, the Scorsese uh, you know troupe uh, after this movie or you know Raging Bull which is the next one and I was thinking oh, okay it would have been great to like have her you know help uh, shape this sucker but um, I mean really it's it it would be more about kind of rewriting their courtship right. and th- this idea of like having them make sense that they're together at least on one level, you know, having their um, professional lives kind of played out a little bit better so that that song, when it hits, it hits a little uh, with even greater impact. And then, you know, see how like his career was starting to take off and then, you know, she like surpassed him. And then, you know, of course, like this piece is in there a little bit, but, you know, her surpassing him, like, you know, then of course, like sort of ruins like whatever, like, you know, (laughs) little chances they had of, of, of having a relationship uh, because, you know, he d- can't handle that, uh, how much more successful she's becoming, you know. One, two. One, two, two three, three, four. Don't ever do that again. You do not kick off the band. I kick off the band. You understand? Don't treat me like don't that. Don't ever do it again. A couple quick uh, little connections. I don't know if you guys uh, noticed some of this stuff, but, like, uh, at one point, you know, during that screwball comedy scene, uh, you're talking about Andy where he's like, you know, faking his leg injury to like <laughs> sneak out of the hotel or whatever. Uh, he was he was like yelling at the guy. He's like, "I was an Anzio, I was an Anzio," which is <laughs> exactly uh, w- one of the places where his uh, character, the Frank the Irishman Sheeran, was in the Irishman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good uh, connection. Kind of, yep. Yeah. And then yeah. And then later, <laughs> during the the whole Bubsy Berkeley uh, sequence of like, you know, we're into Liza Minnelli's career taking off. Uh, and we, we start seeing all these movies she's in. At one point, one of the movies she was in was Ace is High with the Sam <laughs> Rothstein dancers. Really? <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. called Ace is High. <laughs> that's excellent. Oh, that's right. That oh, right, movie. right, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, anyway, I, I thought those are some, some fun connections to the, the last time you were on the show, Andy. The Scorsese verse continues. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> as integrated as this song was, uh, the, the New York, New York, into the, the sort of fabric of the movie itself. I feel like Unchained also was pretty integrated. Now, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, you didn't, uh, it didn't build to, to the song the way that New York, New York did. It New York, New York, like, you know, went on for, for like, you know, an hour and 10, or two hours and 10 minutes and then gets to the song. And you're like, whoa, there it goes. But uh, in Unchained, they did weave it into the plot and, you know, it, it made sense why they were uh, doing it. You know, like a couple of the guys were, you know, there's this whole subplot of uh, musicians and, and, you know, exploring people's talent and everything else while they're locked up in in, uh, Chino. And at one point, you know, a couple of the guys are working on and write this song and then they just, you know, they sing it kind of unceremoniously (laughs) toward toward the end of the movie, like in, in, while everyone's like uh, bunked, uh, bunked up there. Oh, my Lord. It's funny the, how different the original version is, right? You have, uh, mm-hmm. I want to 
call him Tony Todd, and that's not right. Uh, Todd Duncan. Mm-hmm. It's it's not Candyman, but it's the opera singer Todd Duncan. Yeah. He sings the song. Bill, yeah. Uh, you know, much like an opera singer would, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really, really grand. Are you still mine? It was interesting seeing how that came to be in, in, in this movie. Um, which, let's face it, you know, a lot, a lot of the movie kind of feels like an educational film. I thought it was like an industrial. Yeah. yeah. A, a, a better prison system is is possible. Right. Yeah. Type, of, type of film. It's the anti Shawshank, uh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, or, or like I, th- through it, the looking glass, uh, Shawshank. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's the alternate universe Shawshank, right? It's this. Uh, yeah, a compassionate warden. Yeah, it's it. This prisoner who has to come to terms with the crime he actually committed. Uh, minimum security. <laughs> this warden that's very invested in yeah. the prisoners' um, well-being and reform. And <laughs> he teaches them how to escape, just in case they want to get out of there at some point. Yeah, or exactly. The whole uh, movie, uh, Steve, the protagonist, is uh, actually trying to escape and then decides not to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, 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 like you were saying, Brian, like they're invested in like getting them to learn trades, and they're just it's right. not just like you know slave exactly. labor and graft. You can leave whenever you want. Shawshank. Exactly. Yeah. And yet they still had the scene where he was trying to make a case that he's uh, reformed uh, and ready to be released, and he's still got sent back for another six months <laughs> six, yeah. six months to get his sentencing still like he oh, still right. doesn't even know how long he's supposed to be in prison for this also it's the anti shashank in the sense that he's facing hard time like a total of three years <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> not life it, it, it's funny like the the shashank connection because I mean, you know andy you watched this movie first and you you mentioned the the shashank thing and i i, I was kind of on the lookout for it. i mean I, you know a, a lot of it's very obvious but like there yeah. were a couple moments where it was like um I feel like that uh, the Todd Duncan character and another guy who is not um, Steve, the sort of main uh, blonde, uh, I don't know, Kirk Douglas light character. Um, Elroy Hirsch. They were <laughs> Elroy yeah. Hirsch, yeah, football player. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah who was yeah. a famous football player? Yeah. But but you know he's like chin and everything is he, he had Dude, like sharp, Kirk Douglas yeah. look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they were going for the Kirk Douglas look. I don't know if they quite got the performance they were they are yeah they were hoping for. Well, he he had, he had the look. He just uh, wasn't bringing the performance. But but what I was gonna say real quick was that like, you know, Todd Todd Duncan and, and some other guy were, were were talking, and there was this really low shot on them, and behind them you saw like a, a guard tower, and it looked God, it looks so much like the scene in Shawshank where the sniper the warden is talking to you know the the, the young kid, and then mm-hmm. he's like he's like just give me that chance. That's what I thought. <laughs> well it's interesting they even have the scene you know how like the 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 inmates rally around uh in shawshank they rally around um helping the uh young inmate to uh, get his high school degree uh in this one they rally around uh, the inmate to get his hand operated on so that he could play the oh, piano yeah, again yeah. so there's yeah. like Th- through there's, through a relationship th- right yeah, like yeah, so they're building funds. a library yes they're I mean, building a library yeah, exactly, yes yeah. exactly yeah. exactly the, the sort of core uh relationship is between a, a black and a white character you know in, in the 50s and when a, when shawshank took place that was a big deal yeah i really wonder if either stephen king or frank darabont had seen this film 100 percent. oh i i feel like for sure stephen king had to have seen this movie <laughs> Uh, yeah. And like the, the Todd Duncan character, the, the the he was a singer, uh, you know, so he's sort of musically inclined. I, I don't know if you remember the, the detail in Shawshank where you know Red is supposed to be musically inclined, and he has that that he gives him that harmonica and everything. Oh, that's that's right. Yeah. Uh, although in Unchained, you know, he expresses a, l- a, a little more because uh, you know he doesn't have the uh, boot on his neck uh, of the Shawshank repression in the minimum security prison here. It's interesting, Jeremy, that you you said that um, the song re- really works in Unchained because there is that buildup. And one of the things that was really interesting is that not only was the song performed by Todd Duncan uh, beautifully in that scene in the, in, in the jail, but also like they use it as part of the score in the in the film there's that great oh, scene yeah. where Elroy Hirsch is finally coming to terms with confessing to his son that he's you know in jail for something he did um the score is the 
you know, melody to Unchained Melody, and it just works really well. And and made me think that, you know, it's it's really interesting that it's it doesn't just work as a song, but the melody itself um, really works to underscore the the emotion of the film. Yeah, it worked for it worked for Steve. It worked for Eddie, the piano player, mm-hmm. uh, when he was playing his two by four painted like a piano to try to practice to get his <laughs> yeah. head working again. Like they had it going yeah. there. It came in a lot of good good moments, and and it worked for every one of them. I think. Um, and I do agree. It was a nice little seasoning of it during the film that once they sang the whole song, it all kind of came together in my head again as well. They did a nice job of that. Yeah, and it's really nice coming across it in this film because, like Jeremy said, it's a very different performance than what we're used to. Um, very. Very different, but very beautiful as well. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting, the going back to the Shawshank Red, uh, Redemption, because the movie does focus a lot on all those things that the inmates are going through that makes them really human. It like, um, you know, it was based on the book, um, written by, um, Scudder, the first superintendent, uh, who started that, um, the Chino Correctional, um, Institute. He's the, he's the warden in there. Correct. And yeah, it, it was about kind of humanizing the prisoner experience. And it, it's interesting that a lot of that, I think, <laughs> was also done in uh, Shawshank, right? Um, and you just highlighted that scene where he's like trying to, you know, play the piano the way he used to do, <laughs> you know, on a regular basis. Uh, I just, I love the idea though that, you know, like send, yeah, they're prisoners, send them to prison, but, you know, when they come out of prison, have them be functional members of society that can go get a job with a trade, with knowledge, with a skill. And that's kind of where this was yeah. at. And, you know, that's not the way it is. Um, this was obviously a short-term experimental thing, right? Yeah. Treat them as humans uh, in this place. You know, if, if we have to have a carceral system at all, uh, at least uh, have it be uh, a little more humane. They, they said they could wear headphones and listen to any any radio program they wanted. Right. The one guy wanted right. to listen to Dragnet, and mm-hmm. that was, right. can I listen to that? Yeah, listen to whatever you want. They're like, what? You know, yeah. it reminded me yeah. of... Red getting out of uh, prison and working in the grocery store. He's like, hey, boss, you know, I need to take a break. He's like, take a break. <laughs> you know, he's like, wait, I can I, do this on my own, you know? Actually, you're right. Like, There was a moment where they, I, I can't remember the wording, but they, they talk about essentially the, the, the idea of it, people being in institutionalized and, and wanting to stay inside and everything. Yeah. Uh, in, in Unchained. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. interesting because, you know, I really, it was, that aspect of the film was really fascinating um, in terms of how the, the warden was approaching you know people could leave whenever they wanted and like th- there wasn't there wasn't a heavy focus on keeping people in uh because you got one shot and the idea was that this was you know your shot at redemption but the main the main punishment though was like if you guys keep trying to escape then this experiment is over you know the people right. that are allowing this to happen will right. say you'll, no you'll more ruin funding it for everyone else you'll too, ruin it for that. the future of of you know this potential and it's not no, a thing anymore, as right? We, as yeah. we all saw, that uh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely happened. And uh, how much uh, did you enjoy that climactic fight se- fight scene? <laughs> there were some pretty good fights in this it movie. It reminded me a little bit, I had to go back to it, uh, the They Live fight scene between Roddy yeah. Roddy Piper. <laughs> <laughs> it almost went on as long. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty long, but there were some really, uh, really great like sweep the leg moments and yeah. some chairs, and yeah, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. You better find yourself someplace to hide and keep praying nobody ever finds you. Try these on. Look, you crazy mother. Put these on. Hey, stay away from me. I'm telling you, you dumb son of a... Despite the fact that it's not a perfect film, um, it does have this focus on delivering the emotional impact of kind of becoming invested in these these characters and under, like um, getting to you know, spend a period of time with them uh, under these trying circumstances. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I think originally Alex North was just going to compose, you know, just compose a score, but then they asked him to do a song. And I think the the idea behind creating a song that Todd Duncan's character Bill was going to sing um, was really this idea of presenting a scene, because remember that comes after um, Elroy Hirsch, um you know, gets his sentencing postponed. And so it's kind of this uh, emotional downturn in the movie and this idea of him conveying right. that um, forlornness. Wasn't that right when they were all going to hear their sentencing? That Wasn't that the night of and they were all waiting until 
like that sentence was being delivered or, or am I getting that confused? No, I think you're right. I think right after that. Um, so it was like everyone heard... had had something at stake there. Right. right? Like there was show. this. Right. Exactly. There was this um, suspense in that regard and tension. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there was a perfect moment for, for Todd Duncan to sing this song that really conveyed mm-hmm. that kind of forlorn and sadness and longing that a lot of the prisoners were, were feeling. And that idea of imbuing emotion into kind of this movie about about conveying this idea of what prison reform could be, I think was a very conscious one by the filmmakers because like, like um, I was just thinking about the casting is really great because Ty Duncan's performance is actually really good in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, right. I can't say that his all- His acting performance. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure that yeah. all the performance was that great, but his acting performance was great. And mm-hmm. it's interesting that, you know, they cast him uh, to be in the movie um, probably because of, you know, his singing ability. I mean, he was an opera singer. Um, it's actually right, really right. interesting because he was apparently in the premiere production of Porgy and Beth. So there was a conscious effort to um, kind of <laughs> utilize the skill for that that scene. And so I feel like that was, you know, a really great way of giving the, uh, the, the movie like an emotional core that maybe just kind of by its narrative merits may not have accomplished. And it just goes to the fact that they also wrote a song that was so great at cap- capturing that, right? And it was... Um, it's one of the reasons I think the song went on to have this success, not only just because of the lyrics have, having kind of a broad appeal for like a general sense of longing, but also because it, it's a very emotive song that with kind of very minimal lyrics is able to uh, hit such an emotional nerve uh, with the listener. Well said. One last quick thing I wanted to say on, on Unchained, which is like, the, yeah, like I think that a lot of the movie was kind of spent and yes, it is is kind of like heavy-handed with its, its messaging and whatever. But a lot of movies are kind of spent uh, trying to, you know, deprogram all the prisoners who have this. Uh, um, oh my God, what's it? Stockholm syndrome, right? Where, yeah. where the, they're all like, uh, you know, used to their their chains, and they're, they're used to like, well, hey, why didn't you hit me in the face when I right. ran away from you? And it's like, you know, well, why didn't you beat me like a dog uh, when when I said that to you? You know, and everyone's sort of like sort of learning to trust and 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 you know learning to to be human again or whatever it's like it it was really sort of refreshing in that sense as well you know and then and then because everyone's so like emotionally scarred and at such a low point like you're saying andy like the the song kind of does hit at an interesting place i mean to me it, it felt like I, I wanted it just a little later in the story but like uh you know where everyone was you're right like waiting for their parole sentencing uh, or hearing or whatever they call it, um, you know, did like have that impact on you when, when you were watching it. Yeah. And what, what is also really interesting that you brought up this idea of um, not focusing so much on the uh, punishment perspective of, of the criminal system. Um, I think it, it's actually comes across in the song as well, because um, when Alex right. North, um, convinced Heiser to write the lyrics for the song um they focused on the the sense of longing and that the prisoners experience as opposed to that kind of corporal punishment aspect of it in fact i guess uh, they kind of did not want to include the word unchained in it even though it was in the title of the movie so um and, and it is interesting because i i think that's why the song works so well and um, not only was influence, right, the song itself was written for the movie and influenced by what's going on in the movie, but also adds a really great layer to it because it adds that commentary where it's like, um, when it comes to prison reform, you know, let's not focus so much on adding more guards or adding more walls or being harsher or um, being more punitive or corporal punishment, but let's focus on humanizing inmates, understanding what's going on. And I think the song adds to that. And so in that sense, like, the song not only works well on its own, um, but it also uh, works well within the movie. And I think that's a common theme with all three of these songs and why they are they were so successful. You're poor company, Pat. As much as some of the music doesn't work so much and, and Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, I agree. Like, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the song, <laughs> uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door, just because the song is so goddamn good. Yes. Uh, and you know the, the scene itself. Uh, you, you mean the score when you say the music? Yeah. Right. The, yeah. The, the, the scene in and of itself with uh, uh, with Mama's performance, uh, Katie Harado, I think it's the actress. 
all all that stuff like really paid off with that music whereas like some of the other stuff even though like the, the lyrics were on the nose about you know what the bounty hunter was doing and you know some of these other things like you know oh billy freed himself and like and then like some of the the instrumental score as well like um Mm -hmm. in pat garrett it it didn't have that same impact but uh you know it's kind of hard to tell if it's like is it just the combination of that song being so powerful and mama's performance that kind of made the scene where we get uh knocking on heaven's door so powerful or was it mostly like the the song itself i mean like (laughs) but in any case like even though I, I wanted a lot more of the sort of Slim Pickens character before we, we got uh, the the demise of Slim Pickens, um, the the moment in and of itself, like the scene in and of itself was, was really great. Well, this, I think, if we're ready to jump into it, kind of gets at the core of the um, kind of big debate, which is whether Sam Peckinpah actually right. wanted the vocals <laughs> in the scene or not. Oh, really? In terms of Pat Garrett, and uh like unfortunately kind of like you know uh blade runner or something like that there's just a, a bunch of different cuts of the movie it's hard to tell like what the actual movie is or when when you're talking about it you know you could be talking about a totally different thing uh but according to sort of uh sam peck and paul's biographers uh there are four cuts one is the theatrical version mm-hmm. uh another is the preview version or the or the 1988 turner cut uh, it was released in 1988, even though it was, you know, done in 1973. And then there's Peck and Paws cut, and then this special edition 2005 cut. Now, the difference between the Turner cut, the the, pre, the Turner preview cut, and the Peck and Paw cut, like apparently they're they're the exact same. It's just that the uh, Peck and Paw cut had Pat Garrett's wife scene in it as well. So like, so when when Pat Garrett you know, hops into his house and, and chats with his wife for a second. That scene was in the, quote, Peckinpah cut. And the other addition to it is that the Sam Peckinpah's cut had a scrolling legend uh, that linked Pat Garrett's death to the um, Sand Fei Ring Teapot Dome scandal. Yeah, obviously that was not in the theatrical cut. So in 2005, um, Sam Peckinpah's biographers, um, I think mainly Paul Sador, um, kind of got a lot of the elements of from all four cuts and put together a special edition. And basically a lot of it was the theatrical cut augmented with a lot of the other scenes that had been deleted in the various cuts. And by going through and picking what he believed was um, kind of the best version of, of each of these scenes and, how to, and organizing them to kind of best convey Sam Peck and Paul's intention that's how we got the special edition that we all watched so it's kind of interesting because it's I think there's a big question as to whether or not this you know would have been the version that Sam Peck and Paul would have signed off on but the most interesting part of that is that um, in the preview cut the vocals for Knocking on Heaven's Door were not in the scene um, and as the biographers explain um, Sam Peckinpah's longtime collaborator uh, and composer, uh, Jerry Fielding, had been hired to do the score. Um, and Bob Dylan, at, after um, he was introduced to Sam Peckinpah um, by Chris Christopherson, um, Sam Peckinpah really liked <laughs> his song. Uh, he showed him a, a sample of the um, Billy the Kid song, and he really loved it. So he brought him on to, to write a couple of the songs. Um, but at some point, it looks like either the producer or the studio decided that it would be better if Bob Dylan wrote the score because it seems like it, you know, it could have been more marketable. And um, the idea was that um, Jerry Fielding was going to uh, kind of oversee Bob Dylan writing the score, and he wasn't okay with that, so he quit. And it seems like Sam Peckinpah held a grudge because of that. Well, there apparently were, were a lot of things that were being forced upon him, and you know. It was a very difficult you know, production. He, he was and... not uh, not handling it diplomatically, so it was <laughs> it was you know just uh, my way or the highway discussions, and and of course his his way didn't happen. So this was after the Wild Bunch, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't this isn't this when uh, Peck and Paws kind of on on a roll now? Wasn't that a very popular film, very successful film, I should say? Yeah, I think this was supposed to be a um, sequel to it, um, not a sequel, but a follow up film. Um, sure, and. MGM was trying to cash in on on the critical success of Wild Bunch. Well, I mean, he he did do several films in between there, if that's what you're asking. Like, 
I mean, no, I'm, I was just saying because if you know if the studio has had had all this hand in it, I thought that mm-hmm. Peckinpah at this point would have the clout to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to make my movie. Well, I, apparently it's it's like very complicated, but you know, because this is also like a, a time where uh, his alcoholism w- was getting ah. beyond the, the sort of like functioning alcoholic level, uh, you know, so that there was some contention there. MGM itself. They were venturing into a lot of other crazy things, such as the MGM Grand Casino or whatever. Uh, like the, the 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 first iteration of that, anyway. Yeah, right. yeah. They're, they're rushing a lot of their movies through production um, so that they can um, get some cash on the books to fund the MGM Casino. Just get the fact the money machine working, yeah. working full <laughs> blast. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that one of the scenes that was added for this special edition was the uh, prostitute um, uh, orgy that he orgy. Had, that Pat Garrett had. Well, <laughs> what's 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 funny is there there was another scene with the Poe character and I think Elijah Cook Jr. in the preview cut that was cut out. And it was one of the only scenes that didn't have either Pat Garrett or Billy the Kid, and it was cut out because the scene really just served to show how Poe got back to Pat Garrett um, and how they found out where uh, Billy the Kid was. Uh, mm-hmm. But instead, they ended up extending uh, the uh, brothel <laughs> scene because I think in it, one of the prostitutes just get, gets beaten by Pat Garrett and, uh, you know, reveals where Billy the Kid is. So, right. Well, yeah, because he, he beats her up pretty bad at the, at the start of it. You know, you're not giving me the information yeah. I want. And then all of a sudden, the room is full of 10 girls with their shirts <laughs> off taking baths. Yeah. And I was like, like, what hey, the you're, hell? You're going to need to cut me out of these jeans because uh, yeah, <laughs> they've been on for a long weeks, time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, going back to this idea of what the, the you know, Sam Peckinpah's intentions were, it's interesting because like, for, so for the preview cut, the vocals for Knocking on Heaven's Door were, were not there. And, um, you know, there's a, I, I think a pretty good, you know, you can make a pretty good creative argument as to whether or not you feel like having the vocals would have been, too on the nose. I mean, we now know the song to be so iconic. I'm really glad we did watch it because actually after watching both of the scenes with the vocals and not, I actually feel it is more powerful with the vocals, not only just because the song is amazing, but because it just takes the kind of emotional impact of the scene and, and, and you know, wrenches it up because it just playing over that, that shot of Slim Pickens um, looking at his, at his wife as, as his life is, is, um, you know, beautiful uh, sunset scene, and oof, down, yeah. as that cloud is, yeah, that that dark cloud is is falling over him. It's just, um, it's really really powerful. And I would say this, like a lot of the other score had vocals in it, so it's not like it came out of nowhere. Right. So it felt like a music video in parts. Yeah, um, when they would when they would move from scene to scene, there was kind of like the singing narrator, like the bard, and that was Dylan singing like over you know, the visuals of like leading into the next, all right, now here's Pat Garrett's side of it. Now here's, yeah. you know, we're back to Billy, yeah. you know, and it would just have that, a piece of the music come through vocally. Yeah. Interesting that you point that out because one of the reasons why I feel like the vocals do w- work so well in that uh, scene where Slim Pickens dies and why Knocking on Heaven's Door works so well is because it more closely matches the tone of the scene and of the film where I feel like Jeremy mentioned the score doesn't really work very well in the rest of the movie, in part I because yeah. mm-hmm. Sam Peckinpah, uh, you know, be- became very associated with and it's, it's highlighted in Wild Bunch as, you know, creating these anti-Western or revisionist Western films and mm-hmm. um, and, and kind of scra- scraping the veneer. Demythologizing, the his- yeah. Demythologizing, scraping the veneer off the, the Western experience and, and the characters and, and showing all these characters that were flawed and... Uh, contemptible and but also struggling to survive and in, in, in this very difficult um, situation and mm-hmm. I feel like the rest of the score outside of knocking on heaven's door does quite the opposite it romanticizes yeah. Billy the Kid right. and right. his whole experience um, right. in the way that in the way that a lot of Dylan's songs that deal with historical elements do um, they're on the nose about Billy the Kid and there's this kind of romantic quality, you know, just in the, cal- you know, in the caliber of his singing and the, and the music and the kind of um, slightly uh, more, more upbeat tone of the music. Whereas Knocking on Heaven's Door perfectly matches the scene, but also the, the tragic tone, the, the, the tragic tone of the film, right? I mean, and the dramatic tragedy is really highlighted in it. And so for that reason, I think that song works particularly well for that scene, but the rest of the score doesn't work so well because it clashes a little bit, even from the beginning. I mean, it's one of the first things you hear in the opening shot is the score and and it just kind of doesn't quite set the tone that 
about uh, for the movie that you're about to see, right? No, I I, I totally agree. I, I, can I back you up? You, you said something about Peckinpah was doing revisionist work on the on the western. Do you mean he was like revising what the the genre was, or what the storylines of these old uh, west mythological not mythological Billy the Kid was real, but you know the stories behind these. Were you saying that he was well actually changing I, that, that? That is a good word to use. I think is like you know. Yes, a lot of these people were were real, like Wyatt Earp and Billy the Kid and Perry Garrett. Like all these people were real, but the the, the things that they did in their lives uh, were mythologized. You know, B- bigger and, than they were. You mean bigger yeah. and you know heroic and better. Like a lot of them were you know selfish, shitty, murderous, awful people. Billy uh, the Kid you know, was a, a bona fide of... serial killer. That's they said <laughs> yeah. he was a complete psychotic in real life. You can tell from you know, this movie because Chris Christopherson came off. You know, very likable and very affable and not very dangerous at all. He couldn't, you know, shoot very well. I don't know. He he put some bullets in people, man. Uh, he, yeah, he was still kind of a psycho. Keep the change, Bob. Keep change, Bob. I, I forget about that scene because it happens early on, but it is true. But that kind of stands out. I would say even when he shoots the other deputy in the back... Are you talking about the Jack Elam? That's a- Alamosa yeah. Bill. Yeah, even with the his own gang, like okay, let me let me put it to you this way: you never felt like Pat Garrett was any danger of going up against Billy the Kid, um, and yet there is that one scene where he's very, you know, um, <laughs> takes out two or three sheriffs, uh, w- which you know apparently really did happen that he was uh, sentenced to be hanged at some point and then escaped shortly after. But Pat Garrett did kill him. In real life, right? I mean, that is historically well, accurate. That Pat. Oh, okay. Except in Young Guns too, when 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 the old Billy the Kid is telling the story. Part of yeah. the mythology <laughs> is that it's you know um, I know some of the rumors are maybe you let him live, and uh, I mean there have been people claiming to be Billy the Kid afterwards. I think, and um, I don't think this movie portrays that, and it, it shouldn't because it's more of the tragedy. I mean, going back to uh, one of our previous episodes, it really is a little bit like Heat, where um, they're kind of the flip side of two coins. The electorate wants you gone out of the country. But are they telling me? Are they asking me? I'm asking you. But in five days, I'm making you. I was thinking about this. I, I actually do think that it, it uh, Michael Mann was probably very influenced by this film because there's, oh, sure. there's an element of Pat Garrett and Billy Kidd kind of representing different sides of the same coin. And, um, you know, Pat Gar- Garrett making this decision to settled down and because he wanted to grow old with the west right he wanted to everything yeah this was going to be changing and he wanted to change along with it right selling out to these forces of corruption that were um kind of consuming and exploiting um what remained of the west right um and and trying to kind of suck all the profit out of it and, and acquiring it by these you know very corrupt means you know him selling out then you had billy the kid who you know wasn't and you know had a chance to run away and didn't and um, and yet they had this intense relationship where they um, had, you know, presumably had a lot of love for each other, right? I mean, they, they father figure. I think they said it once, one, one time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys think that the Michael Mann connection is the fact that Pat Garrett was played by what William Graham? Is that his, no? That's not his name. Oh, uh, William Peterson. William Peterson. Yeah. Um, he played Pat Garrett in Young Guns too. <laughs> oh, I, I did not catch that. That is a nice connection. We were talking about the uh, that the, the fine line between. Like enforcing the law and you know being the outlaw or whatever, and like and they they had that he had that really great line while he's sitting there with Jack Elam at dinner, and it's like uh, it wasn't that long ago that I was the law and Pat was an outlaw. The law is a funny thing, ain't it? It wasn't long ago I was the law, right for Chisholm. But old Pat was an outlaw. The law is a funny thing, ain't it? I I think from from sort of that moment on, like the movie kind of like you know hooked me. I I, I feel like again kind of like New York, New York, like the the beginning uh i had i had trouble like you know getting uh, my, my foothold into and, and finding my interest in the movie because it, it was like it, you know it, it just felt like a bunch of like really good scenes that were not connected to one another and it was like oh we're here now okay what's happening okay uh, oh the the henerellissimo is uh you know and his family is getting raped by this uh you know gang of goons and it's like what's going on you know it's like it's like just be these random things happening it feels like and i think the important part of like talking about the the different versions of the movie and like the the state of sam peckinpah at the time and all these other things i i think it was important just to point out like 
because of how disjointed a lot of the movie feels. I mean, like, there's a lot of great stuff in it, and I think uh, one can um, uh, imagine sort of the connective tissue, but I, I feel like a lot of the t- connective tissue wasn't there. There's some work to be done as a viewer, you mean, yeah. like to, yeah, paste it together. I agree. Yeah, exactly. To, to make those things happen, like, oh, you know, James Coburn's character, uh, you know, Pat Garrett, well, he, he wanted to sell out and do all this stuff. Like, well, why? I mean, like, all, all that stuff is, like, is, is not there. It's, like, not clear. It's not clear, like, why it was made that way for him. Like, what was he doing that was the outlaw before? You know, it's like, you know, these character pieces, these story pieces that, um, you know, just need to be filled out a little more. Uh, Without having to come in with previous research and knowledge of, of <laughs> right, this guy, right. these two, their history, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but the thing is, like, I mean, d- despite actually having some of that stuff, the, the sort of cartilage of the movie missing in, at times, like because of, of uh, you know, a lot of the great scene work and like the the uh, actors themselves, like the performances, like the direction, everything else, like at least for myself, I, I was left like, you know, feeling, um, you know, that the movie w- was, was pretty powerful, especially toward the very end there. As, as much as you'd want to have sort of the, the beginning uh, fleshed out a little better, it kind of left you on a, on, a, on a better note. But that at that point in the film, Pat Garrett is well on his way, probably three or four days of no sleep of looking for Billy at this point, kind of at the end of his, you know, uh, energy level. And I think that that's right around the time when he goes into that bar and he has Alias or Bob Dylan read all the cans yes, of food. He's yes. read them aloud so we can hear you just so we can keep. And then he puts the guy's hat on. Let's play yeah. a little poker. And he just, he like I thought that that was a really good. Michael Corleone's bodyguard. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's interesting how much Bob Dylan is in the movie. He, he uh, looks a little awkward. I, I have to say, like he, th- you've got Coburn that's like really like sitting in the scene, like oh, like owning that. I mean, even Chris Christopherson, I think that this is one of his first movies, if yeah. not his first. He was amazing in it. Yeah, you know? he was great. And yeah, he was really good. But then, yeah, Bob Dylan kind of it was like almost like someone was like the Peck and Paw. Maybe he was like, come on, look at the camera, and he kind of. <laughs> you know, like look around and yeah, just, right, we, need, no. we need to see your face here. He, he, you know? he had a little like, bit of the, the the wooden performance that we got with uh, with the football player in the last movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's an it's an all star cast of of you know Western character actors, and then you've got yeah. Bob Dylan. <laughs> You're gonna stick out like a sore thumb in, in that instance. Yeah, that's your name, boy. Alias. Alias what? Alias anything you please. Speaking of the ending a little bit on Pat Garrett, it's like, you know, they started with the demise of Pat Garrett before he had any context. I thought for sure we'd be going back to that to get a little more context, but we didn't. Um, And then also, like, the assassination in the very beginning (laughs) kind of had this, like, you know, upbeat ding, ding, ding score. Yeah. That kind of, uh, you know, you know, it definitely threw me off while I was watching it because, you know, th- they got how uh, sort of menacing the opening is of Wild Bunch, and I, it, it kind of felt like that the drums, uh, that <laughs> sound, and whatever would have uh, would have would have benefited a, a scene like that. Uh, also, I guess uh, chickens were definitely harmed in the filming of this movie. <laughs> Holy shit! That bothered me more than anything in that movie. I know that. I watch that scene a lot, and it is kind of uncomfortable to sit through. I mean, it's very, yes. very visceral. Yes, I mean, those are straight-up close-ups of roosters or chickens <laughs> getting their heads blown off, man. In, in regards to what you were saying, Jeremy, I think, yeah, that, that is kind of how I characterize why the, the score overall just doesn't work. I, I feel like that the doesn't match the, the tone of the film. No. It, it doesn't match that you know, that, that idea of like scraping the veneer off this off of this genre. And, and How much more powerful would would that song have been had it had they just waited on it you know what i mean if they had kind of a similar score that matched the film more and then the slim pickens scene they drop that bomb of that song on you that would have been so much more impactful yeah. while it wouldn't have gone with the rest of the score so to speak it i think it would have sat on its own which it already does at least from our point of view like as a scene i imagine it, it, it's hard to kind of see what, what the movie was like uh back then but like you know because this era of bob dylan um Actually, because Knocking on Heaven's Door is such an outlier of this era of Bob Dylan, where his like sort of Western sound is more like the Man in Me, mm-hmm. uh, the the uh, you know, the the one used Big so ironically mm-hmm. and and uh, to great effect in Big Lebowski, like a lot of the other 
pieces of the score here in this movie kind of felt like that where where and it had that sort of like ironic quality like based on what you're looking at like something you know just as crazy as the prison escape you know <laughs> with Billy the kid you know blowing away the deputy or whatever he was Bob and um you know then we're just hearing this like cheerful uh kind of twangy you know the man and me type song yeah i think it cuts to I a mean, montage of him riding out in the mm-hmm. into the into the sunset like but that but wasn't yet. that after um he he sent one of those guys to go get him the best horse in town and the first thing that horse does is buck him off <laughs> yeah. and, and it was kind of like go 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 yeah. let me get back on yeah. <laughs> get out of here now you know like yeah, I was he, like he just got done shooting that guy with like a, yes, a shotgun in the back. Full, full of coins <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're waiting for keep the change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he did say that, though. Yeah. He said keep, keep the, the change, Bob. Yeah. Keep the change, you filthy animal. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say to what degree um, Peckinpah was in, not necessarily was involved, but kind of signed off on the theatrical cut. You know, some places you read, it says that they, you know, the cast and crew disowned the theatrical cut. Paul Sador in the in the commentary says that he, you know, Sam Peckinpah did a lot of work on it. Um, but did he sign off on it? Is that the ending he wanted? Would mm-hmm. Bob Dylan have done most of the score? Would we even have heard Knocking on Heaven's Door in the movie? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that it's, um, this kind of gets back to that question as what is the film? Is the film you know, uh, what we've seen and what gets established in popular culture. I think there's been an attempt to kind of rewrite that with this film. Um, or is it what's the director's intention all along? You know, it's it's kind of hard to say. Um, and if they didn't use the vocals, would the song ended, would it, the song have ended up in the album, which although it wasn't, apparently wasn't very critically successful, it became a huge hit. So it's kind of, would, would he, I mean, presumably Sam Peckinpah didn't write, want him to write songs, but... Who knows if it would have ended up in the album if they chose not to use it in the movie? No, exactly, and and you know it's it's uh, the the director's intentions and whatever else. I mean, it's like you can't just go off the director's cut, uh, you know, a, as technical as that sounds. Like, you know, in in the editing process, you know, you get the movie, you get an assembly, the editor puts together a thing that's the editor's cut, and then the director comes in, changes stuff around. That becomes the director's cut. That then is shown to the studio heads and from there it's it's winnowed down and and becomes the movie that is supposed to come out theatrically now in this case the like he was like kicked off the project at one point or like you know had certain things taken away from him he apparently maintained that that preview cut plus the wife uh pat garrett's wife scene uh was his like I don't know, his cut or something, but yeah. And that's the cut he would show that was to a lot of people. people. Exactly. I mean, uh, famously, and stuff, so. I guess Martin Scorsese side around the time he was right, right. Um, uh, finishing uh, Mean Streets and he really liked it. Um, interestingly enough, there's some very interesting connections between for uh, between Martin Scorsese and all the films, right? We have LQ Jones in this movie in that, in that pivotal knocking on heaven's door scene <laughs> I'm who was it exactly <laughs> is in casino you also um wasn't there a version of unchained melody in goodfellas yeah yeah exactly i mean it was a, it was a way different version a it's like doo-wop version yeah like most people kind of stick to the the well now the righteous brothers version but like the righteous brothers version you know is not too far off from i, I think the, the original sort of opera singer version but this one was was way different. It, it sounded a little more like Speedo, if you remember that song in in Goodfellas. But it, it was just used as like score uh, source music in in Goodfellas. It was really great to watch all these films. I had seen New York, New York, so that's one of the ones I started off with. But I I had not seen Unchained. Um, or uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. So it was a really great experience, like I mentioned earlier, and just experiencing seeing these songs in the original form for the first time with the intended emotional impact. You know, at the same time, recognizing the songs, but also understanding their, you know, power within the film. Um, And what's really great about all three songs, I mean, notably, I think all three of the songs have become their popularity, in you know, in just our 
popular culture and just our, our consciousness has kind of outgrown all these films, right? I mean, most that that's what why we pick these films is that you know uh, very few people would probably associate these songs with the their original right. films. Um, we mentioned K. Sirak Sira had the you know kind of same effect, um, and. What's interesting is part of that is because, you know, they're not perfect films. Um, you know, we have with Unchained, it's kind of um, more an adaptation of this book that was meant to kind of convey all the ideas. Yeah. yeah, it's informative. It had a kind of an educational quality to mm-hmm. it with um, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. I mean, <laughs> we have the issue of not exactly know what the definitive version of it, but... Um, uh-huh. We know that theatrical version was not very successful, perhaps because it wasn't the strongest of all the versions and it didn't have everything that Sam Peckinpah wanted. Um, and then, you know, New York, New York, I think is probably one of the kind of lesser known or seen or known or um, loved Scorsese Celebrated, film. Celebrated, yeah. Celebrated, yeah. I mean, I actually have grown to really like the film and um, really like watching it and can kind of sit through that first opening app. But, you know, it's not a perfect film. Like Jeremy said, like every time you watch it, you kind of reminded us some of the things that could have made, made the film bigger. But mm-hmm. what is really cool is that, you know, with all their imperfections, the films um, influence these songs, right? To some degree, like the, the creative forces, like all the kind of um, all the people that, that help make the movie and kind of the kind of creative atmosphere that was created to, to bring these, films to live contributed to the writing of these songs and and really to the the power that these songs have and um on their own and you know in, in a way that they've been these songs have been able to cement themselves in in popular culture and and have been so important to uh, everybody that's a fans of those songs um uh, because of that and not just that they didn't just you know um the films didn't just influence the creation of those songs but it also influenced the um, artists that went on to cover these songs and become right. very famous for singing them, which is really interesting because at some point, you know, Frank Sinatra listened to New York and really, you know, liked the song and thought, wow, I can bring, you know, my creative spin on it. And um, I could, you know, was, re- you know, um, really, really influenced by it. And, 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 and you get this great, great song that's going to become one of, you know, his most iconic songs in his voix. And then, you know, um, uh, with Unchained Melody, the Righteous Brothers, you know, um, probably the, <laughs> their most popular song. And, yeah. you know, uh, they, you know, what's interesting in that song is they added a, a, an additional stanza. So the song itself kind of took on its uh, a new life and um, it became its own standard and obviously probably their most popular song. And so it kind of su- such an important part of their careers. Right. And with Bob Dylan knocking on heaven's door, I mean, there's a long history of of songs that uh, and covers and um, and and popular songs that that Bob Dylan, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> blessed us with and and uh, really uh, influenced other artists with. So um, you know that was kind of in continuation of that. Um, but so not not only did these um, films, you know, give us these songs and allowed these songs to cement themselves. Um, in popular culture, but the, to some degree, by having these songs in those movies, the films themselves have cemented themselves in film history. Even though they're not necessarily perfect films, they can, you know, they'll at least always be remembered, can't always be remembered for that part of it. Hell yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> well, well said. Thanks, Andy. That was really good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that was kind of my thesis for the episode. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, fantastic. We should talk about uh, next week. Um, next week we have... A very special episode. This is our first promotional episode, I believe, right, Jeremy? <laughs> I, I think so. That, I think that's uh, you know part of it. It's a integrated marketing campaign. I don't know. In, yes, but, we uh, are the influencers in yeah. this instance. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're um, going to be talking um, about. Uh, we had Alex Lamb on um, for our Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, inspiring episode, mm-hmm. and um, we had mentioned on that episode that he's doing a documentary about. Don the Beachcomber, and uh, we we will be having a special episode all about that. Uh, what are the films again, Jeremy? We've got um, movies uh, programmed by both Alex Lamb and uh, his uh, co-producer on this uh, Don the Beachcomber documentary, Max Well. The movies they picked were the 1950 documentary Contiki, the 1958 South Pacific, and 1963's Donovan's Reef. 
all sort of taking place in the sort of uh, South Seas in various realms of Polynesia and, uh, you know, kind of uh, expressing America's fascination with Polynesia at that time, uh, as well as uh, tiki culture in general. Uh, I'm sure that they'll have a better way to tie all that together, but uh, that's how I understand this one to be. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. It should be fun. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next week. Ciao. One, two. One, two, three, four. Come on. Like that? Yeah, it's good.